Michael can bring his own chair into this room. Um, <laughs> what did you sign on with? Um, why don't we let Bob start? Because he, you're leaving earlier, and that way you're you're done first, and um, he's got to be out of here at five. And not that you're going go to go five fifteen. So that doesn't really matter. But yeah. I'll go yeah. first. If you want to do the international first, then you and I can. I'll go first. You go second. It's fine with me. Whatever. Cherry's coming in. Then you, you do want to have Q and A. Yeah. Yes, I do. Like I say, I'm, I'm assuming everyone's going to go about ten minutes, and um, I'll then we'll, we'll, uh, you know, I'll, I'll ask if any one of the panel wants to say anything to respond, and then just open it up to. <laughs> One of the things people in Ann Arbor can do is, uh, well, my neighborhood is doing it on Saturday. We're going to use our, we live near the stadium, and uh, we do parking, football parking. We charge it like 20 bucks, so we're going to price fix and donate it all to charities. Who's the camera? Um, the UM station, I think. Yeah. Um, we've got a full room, and I'm going to violate Michigan procedure. Um, which is usually not to start until 10 minutes after the hour, but um, we certainly got plenty of people here, and I think we should probably get going. Um, I'm Rebecca Blank. I'm the dean of the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy, and um, I appreciate all of your coming this afternoon. Um, I suspect all of us have been spent much of this last week sort of trying to cope with both the sense of personal loss as well as these pictures that keep replaying in our minds from the um, horrible events that happened last Tuesday. One of the ways in which, of course, academics cope with those sorts of events and try to absorb them is to try to explain them and understand them and fit them into patterns um, that we hope will help us find some ways to prevent them from happening again. And that is what this panel is about. It's called Responding to Terrorism. We've got four experts here, two focused on the international side and two focused on the domestic side, to talk about how can we respond and how can we prevent this from happening again. Um, the one thing I would like to say before we start is that this is a topic that we are all still very emotionally involved in, and there's going to be a lot of disagreement in this room. There's probably going to be a disagreement amongst the panelists. I know there'll be disagreement within the audience, and I simply ask that all of us respect each other's <coughs> opinions and um, allow everyone to communicate where they are and uh, what their questions are. The plan is to have each panelist talk for no more than 10 minutes, and I will try very hard to keep them to that. Um, and then to open it up for um, questions and answers back and forth from the audience. Um, so that's where we're going. Um, let me introduce our four panelists here at the beginning, and um, I would just let them um, do this in, in the appropriate order. Um, the first speaker here is going to be Professor Bob Axelrod, who's over on the end here. Um, Bob is the Arthur Bromage Distinguished University <coughs> Professor. He works on international security issues and complex decision making. He's jointly appointed in both the Ford School and the Political Science Department. Um, the next speaker is going to be Ken Lieberthal in the middle. Um, Ken is um, in the Political Science Department and in the School of Business. Um, he is a professor of political science and at the Center for Chinese Studies. Um, most notably for much of the last three years, he has served in the White House and the Clinton administration as a national security advisor, primarily on Asian-related issues and Chinese-related issues. Um, following him will be Rick Hall to my immediate left. Rick is a professor in the Ford School and in the, public, uh, and in the political science program. Um, Rick's expertise is working with congressional decision making, and we'll talk about how Congress um, you know, will and should respond to this. Um, he um, <laughs> has written a number of books about congressional decision making, one of which won the um, Fenno Prize from the American Political Science Association. And our last speaker is David Thatcher, um, who's there between Bob and Ken. Um, David is in the Ford School of Public Policy and in the Urban Planning program in the Taubman School, and um, David works on policing issues and on profiling issues and is going to talk about how we within this country um, try to go about dealing with terrorism and policing in an effective way that avoids some of the worst types of profiling <coughs> that I suspect many of us want to avoid. So that's the, um, the, uh, the plan for today, and I think I'll just let Bob start and go from there. Thank you, Becky. Um, I'm going to talk about two things. One is what the United States government can do. And the second is what we in Ann Arbor can do. Bob, can you put the mic in front of you? The first thing is the American response is being called a war. And I think 
it's better to think of this more like a war on drugs or the war on poverty or the war on cancer than, say, the war on Japan in World War II. That it's going to be a long struggle without, um, uh, ne without necessarily having the military part the dominant part. And the unfortunate part about the imagery of war is that we tend to think of it as military only or military primarily. It seems to me the key in judging success is whether terrorists and their supporters are recruited faster than they're eliminated. If the United States does something that kills five terrorists but causes 5,000 people in the Muslim world to hate the United States and sign up, that's not a big gain. That's a big loss. And what that means is that we have to be very sensitive to Muslim concerns and perspectives. An example would be, take the word crusade used by some American leaders. This is just the absolutely perfectly wrong thing to do because to a Muslim, crusade means invasion by infidels. So if we call it a crusade, it's the only thing they'll agree with us, that, uh, that it is a crusade. But to them, that's the worst possible way of thinking about it. So the second aspect of the recruitment issue is Pakistan. And the hard thing for the administration is not to ask Pakistan for more than the regime can manage. As you know, it's a regime that has substantial support for the Taliban and yet has agreed to cooperate with the United States. And if the uh, government falls because it has become too much aligned with the United States, that would be a disaster. The third thing is the United States has to justify, to the extent it can, whatever military acts it, it, it performs. This is really very hard to do. The United States can claim, as they have, that uh, bin Laden is the key, although he's not the only element, but it's hard to prove that. Whatever evidence we have might not be convincing to somebody else, and much of the best evidence would reveal sources and methods that would uh, uh, har harm the further struggle against terrorism. So uh, the justification of military acts is really very hard to do, but it's worth making some sacrifices in future capabilities, uh, I think, in order to be able to do that. And of course, justification of military acts is easier to the extent that the acts are really restrained and don't, and don't seem to be just uh, uh, indiscriminate. The second major issue is police and intelligence work, which clearly is critical here. The United States has the capability of doing anything if it could figure out what to do. Now, we can level any village in the world, but which village is it? It can level any cave, but which cave is it? That's a police and, and, and intelligence kind of issue, and Dave Thatcher is going to be addressing that primarily. But let me mention uh, two aspects of it uh, in particular. One is the possibility of tracking down money leads as well as human leads. Uh, and if we could do that, we could, we could really uh, um, thwart a lot of uh, ability to ma undertake major activities. Second, we, we have to rely on our friends. For example, Pakistan has a good deal of intelligence about Afghanistan, and we have to rely on, on that. And Israel presumably has other intelligence about other terrorists and so on. And, we, and so we can't just do this alone. So far, it's been a complete failure of intelligence. Clearly, the idea that there was no advance warning of something that involved such a tremendous level of sophistication and coordination and planning uh, and training and, um, and 19 people willing to commit suicide, we didn't have any inkling of that. That's a clear failure, and so we've got to obviously do a hell of a lot better. Um, we have to beware of mission creep. The idea that, for example, a small group goes in Afghanistan, captures one base, then they're under fire, so then more people go to rescue them, and then more people go to rescue them, and before you know it, you occupy the whole country. If that happens, the United States could easily be in the kind of situation that Israel is in in the West Bank, which would be absolutely horrible. And therefore, a real uh, challenge is to be able to not let the uh, level of, acti of military activity constantly increase, even if there's not very much success from the small, lo smaller level. Another thing is refugees. The newspapers don't talk about this. Television doesn't talk about it much. But there are already 2.5 million Afghanistani refugees in Iran and Pakistan. 
and about a, min, a million internally displaced refugees within Afghanistan. That's before last <laughs> week. Now there's a lot more. Those people are in serious trouble. Not only that, but Afghanistan has had a drought for the last three years, and the United Nations has just said that while they're evacuating their facilities to distribute food, by November, five million Afghanis will de be dependent on food distribution, but there won't be outsiders to do that, to bring that food in and distribute it. We have to remember that the uh, Palestinian refugee camps that were quasi-permanent after 1948 were the breeding grounds of much of the terrorism for good reason. And we don't want to have all that happen again. So we do need to pay attention to refugees, their plight, both from a humanitarian point of view and from a political point of view. The fourth thing is um, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Unless that is resolved, terrorism will never end. So we need to pay attention to that. Well, what can we in Ann Arbor do? One thing is to reach out to Arab Americans and Muslims and say that we understand that they're not the problem. And if other Americans have discriminated against them or displayed prejudice, we at least as individuals abhor that. And they do have some friends. Second, of course, is raise money. Third, for, for relief. Third of, is preach patience. The administration has been a tremendous pressure to show progress, results, bomb them, something. And to the extent that they're pressured by the public or polit political leaders, they're in a very difficult position. And so preaching patience is helpful. We also have to be, watch our civil liberties. There's going to be a rush to judgment about uh, the number of things that could be done to make investigation easier. And some of those are appropriate, and some of those we're going to regret 10 years from now. And we need to keep a close eye on that. And finally, stay informed. You'll soon learn, I suspect, the difference between Tajikistan and Turkmenistan. <laughs> and the difference between Shiite and Sunni, which you may already know. These things will become important, I suspect. So keep informed, and if necessary, organize. College campuses have often been a central focus of political organization, and it may come to be appropriate again. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Ken Lieberthal. Um, thank you. It's uh, uh, not surprising that Bob and I share many similar conclusions, uh, and I want to put a, a kind of way of getting there in a slightly different framework, but what I have to say is just highly compatible with, to my mind, the very wise words that you just heard from Bob. Uh, I think, uh, I've tried to think of this a little bit from a kind of, uh, uh, you know, if you're participating in foreign policy decision making in the White House, how should you think about this issue? And then what should you do? What are the key imperatives to follow up? And it seems to me that uh, one way to uh, figure out what to do is to figure out what the terrorists are trying to accomplish and then organize your reaction to foil uh, their top goals. You have to start off with the recognition that they have been unbelievably successful in what they've done to this point. I mean, we have 19 people who committed suicide and probably a network of uh, somewhere under a few hundred people supporting them, all civilian, uh, and they've done more damage to our country than any army could have done, uh, and probably to the global financial system uh, and to politics in many other countries at the same time. I mean, this is absolutely, this is what you call uh, asymmetrical warfare taken to its highest level. Uh, but what they did initially was tactical. Uh, what their strategic goals are, it seems to me, are two. Uh, one is to uh, have the United States, people of the United States and the government of the United States uh, emerge from this uh, uh, terrible uh, week that we've had uh, feeling insecure and demoralized, basically becoming paralyzed or losing our ability to adopt a sustained, tough, smart set of policies to deal with the issue in front of us. Uh, how do you demoralize the people of the United States after this terrible event? You wait until the shock is over, people begin to recover, and then you hit them again unlikely to hit them again with an airplane attack because security is so tight, the chances of success are small. So instead, you release anthrax into the New York City 
subway ventilation system. It can kill a million people, and we'll never find out who did it. Uh, or engage in cyber warfare to shut down public utilities across the United States within a 30-minute period. Uh, or other things like that, all of which are quite feasible to do. Uh, and so uh, one thing that we have to be concerned about is what's the next step? And you see some of our government officials talking about that concern now, but the problem is the dangers are really, <laughs> they could come from anywhere. Second thing terrorists are trying to do is to create the conditions to drive us out of the Middle East. Uh, and so that in a peculiar fashion, what all of us in our heart of hearts, I suspect, would like to see, which is some dramatic military response that would teach them a lesson or would somehow rather get back at them. Uh, all of that is precisely what Osama bin Laden wants to see, too, uh, because that is a response that would, uh, on the one hand, highlight American military superiority, and on the other hand, highlight American callousness uh, concerning innocent Muslim lives. And by the way, the one group you would not kill would be the terrorists involved, because they're smart enough to get out of the way, and their intelligence would tell them we were coming. Uh, so that a uh, kind of spasm military response is both what they seek uh, and clearly what we should avoid. Uh, let me add, though, even with reasonably smart responses, uh, if we do not handle things carefully, we are putting at risk uh, what is <coughs> what must be considered uh, quite unstable situations in Pakistan which will have dramatic consequences if the Pakistani government falls apart. I believe also in Saudi Arabia, uh, which does not stand on strong feet to my mind, and a lot of this tracks back to there in various ways. If we were to undertake major military action, you would have problems in more, uh, in tougher Muslim communities well into Southeast Asia, into Indonesia. President uh, Bush is meeting with uh, uh, the head of Indonesia, Megawati, uh, today. Uh, and that is a government that we are trying to stabilize and, and support. Uh, we could do nothing worse uh, than to create greater problems among the Muslim population in Indonesia, which is the largest Muslim population in any country in the world today. Um, if you were to, in worst case, end up with uh, Pakistan devolving into civil war and Saudi Arabia highly unstable, we can have, as we try to emerge from our current economic slump, a global energy crisis at the same time that we've got a land war in Asia that is drawing us in, in Central Asia that's drawing us in. That is not something that we want to get involved in. And clearly, other partners that we would need in the effort would pull back if they see American clumsiness in this kind of response. So as Bob was suggesting, uh, the implications for the Bush administration are uh, that they have a very difficult task ahead of them. Uh, there are no easy answers. There is no conventional wisdom that suffices. But I think there are building blocks of a sensible response, and it's worth kind of sketching those out. And here again, my overlap with Bob will be considerable, but let me uh, kind of reinforce some of his messages. One is it seems to me that the administration has to take the lead in turning American anger into American resolve, not into American frustration and American passion, uh, because the answer here is going to be a long-term effort gradually to shift the balance in directions that make us more secure and terrorists less able to function. That is not dramatic, high-profile stuff. So you really have to educate the populace that this is a long-term, low-visibility, high-cost, difficult effort, and it's the only way to go. Uh, and so, you know, kind of the rhetoric, Bob picked out use of the term crusade. I agree with that very much. But also this rhetoric, you know, we're going to smoke them out and we're going to chase them down. And, you know, this, you know it doesn't, doesn't fit the bill. Uh, and it also does not reassure the leaders of the, uh, of the many other countries who will have to cooperate with us if we're going to do an effective job. So I think that the White House still has to uh, go a little farther in finding its, its political footing uh, so that it can uh, sustain long-term support. Uh, secondly, we're going to have to tighten domestic security against follow-on attacks. And here I'm not talking about the long run, I'm talking about today. Uh, and for the coming weeks when the possibility of that uh, is quite substantial. 
and uh, hopefully we will be successful. I personally think it's quite likely that there will be efforts made on the other side to try to do something very dramatic, and the question is whether we can find it and cut it off fast enough. Uh, thirdly, uh, as Bob indicated, we have to develop necessary intelligence on the terrorist structures, resources, and methods. Uh, that is long term. That requires cooperation not only from Pakistan and Saudi Arabia, but from Russia and China as we go after the financial networks uh, from Switzerland, from Israel, which happens to be a center of money laundering in the world. Uh, and from many other places uh, where we coordinate information on a real-time basis uh, and have countries do things that are very uncomfortable given their domestic laws uh, in order to provide the information necessary to cut off the financial flows that allow all of this to take place. Uh, we have to infiltrate terrorist networks, which means that you have to recruit terrorists. And when you find them, you don't kill them, you pay them. Uh, and you pay them so that you can get inside and gradually develop the information you need because these things are set up in a cellular fashion <laughs> where any given cell doesn't know about very much that's going on elsewhere. So you, it's very painstaking. You have to track this bit by bit and then use force only when it can be the most damaging results you can possibly achieve from a limited use of force. And that's when you call in the people who can use that kind of force. We will have to, with most of our use of force, use special operations teams. Uh, these are the kinds of teams, for example, that you drop into Afghanistan and they live there for weeks or months at a time, uh, blend into the population, work the local markets, uh, develop the agents, uh, and eventually direct uh, helicopters or other means, that, you know, other platforms for uh, high explosives uh, to very, very particular targets. Uh, we'll have to finally build and sustain a <coughs> diplomatic coalition for the long haul so that we can squeeze very hard those who must be squeezed and also obtain the political and other help that we'll require from most of the other governments in the world. This, to my mind, requires going far beyond the usual list of friends and allies. Uh, um, I mean, for obvious reasons, our usual list of friends and allies doesn't happen to include the people who are closest to politically and otherwise uh, the folks we're going after. Uh, and it will require, very importantly, being sensitive to the needs of the governments whose cooperation we are seeking to elicit. We will not do very well if we sit there and simply demand a list of things that we need from each government. Most of the things that we will need are things that are difficult for other governments to deliver. They pose enormous domestic problems for those governments. Uh, and those governments will want things in return. I'm not talking about payments of cash. I'm talking about policy adjustments in the United States uh, that help them deal with their problems, whether we like it or not. In other words, a kind of style of unilateralism, of saying this is what's good for the United States, what's good for the United States is good for everyone, and therefore we expect you to do the following, is going to produce enormous frustration and failure, uh, and will make the terrorist act of September 11 even more successful than it's been to date. <coughs> So to sum up, these developments are a security nightmare. Uh, it's a security nightmare that has enormous consequences, uh, not only for the U.S., but for many others around the world. Uh, we can take serious measures to limit the damage and to try to gain the upper hand over time, but I think that will require a set of priorities and approaches that, frankly, will require that this administration uh, learn to do things very differently from the way it conducted itself from January 20th to September 11th in the international arena. Uh, and let me say, I say that not sarcastically. Uh, I and I, everyone else has to wish the president and his team extremely well because all of our futures depend on their doing this work well. Uh, and we have to recognize how difficult a task they face. Uh, and we'll have to watch it carefully as it unfolds. Uh, but, you know, what I've done here, I think what Bob was trying to do is to try to simply give you a, a kind of broad set of building blocks, recognizing that if you ask us, well, concretely, what should the president do tomorrow, we will have uh, a lot of discomfort, but we can come up with some ideas. We may or may not agree on them. But uh, I think we do agree on what the broad building blocks of an appropriate response are and are not. And I hope that gives you a, some basis for evaluating the way things unfold from here on out. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Rick Hall. Um, Rick, given we've got a number of people out in the hall, um, you might want to stand up or make sure you speak loudly so folks out there can hear you. Okay. Yeah. Um, 
three things I'd like to uh, talk about in, in the few minutes allowed to me. Um, one, I'd like to describe the response, uh, the congressional response to the terrorist acts of last week. Um, um, when Jude Hayes, <coughs> who organized this conference, called me um, late last week uh, and asked me to serve on this panel and, and comment on the congressional response um, to the terrorist attacks, um, I said, sure, uh, that ought to be easy. I can sum it up in a few words. Uh, whatever the president wants, rubber stamp it. Uh, well, I want to talk a little bit about how true I think that is uh, in capturing what the congressional response has been. Um, I also want to note that uh, that is insofar as what the president has wanted to do uh, in terms of foreign policy. I also want to talk about more recent developments that involve uh, legislation and other actions that uh, focus more on domestic affairs in that Congress has been uh, more active, is starting to become more active. So I'll describe the response both in terms of foreign policy and domestic policy. Uh, and then I'll try to say a few words about why I believe Congress has responded the way that it has. Um, if I have time then, um, which I doubt, um, I'll try to offer some remarks about what I think the congressional response ought to be um, in the coming uh, weeks. Um, those remarks will echo, I think, the remarks of both uh, Bob and Ken. Okay, so what's the, con what's the congressional response been? Well, it's been, at least all last week, it struck me, that it was essentially to um, rally round behind the president uh, to effectively say uh, very little other than that we um, want to act with unity, uh, with resolve, and um, the policymaker in this context is the president. We all ought to stand behind him. Now, historically, in fact, there is um, long precedent, a uh, long list of precedents for Congress doing just that, uh, especially, especially when war hysteria is the emotion of the moment. Um, in fact, uh, in, cr in foreign policy crises or emergencies, Congress has rarely taken the initiative. Uh, the founders had, in fact, anticipated just that. Uh, uh, in writing the Constitution, uh, Madison, Hamilton, and Jay in the Federalist Papers talk about that in some detail, saying how Congress simply um, organizationally doesn't have the capacity to act with um, the unity, the speed, the surprise, element of surprise that's necessary in conducting foreign policy. But if Congress has seldom taken the initiative, it's, it's often in American history played the role of the critic, the obstructionist. Uh, perhaps the modifier of uh, policies that have been um, developed and, um, and pushed um, by the White House. Um, indeed, presidential war powers have been a perennial theme in the relationship between these two branches. Um, and at times, Congress has officially tried to uh, assert itself. It did so, for instance, in the War Powers Resolution of 1973, which, by the way, dealt with any executive commitment of troops, uh, combat troops, not simply kind of a full war mobilization, um, uh, uh, full-blown war mobilization. Uh, that resolution required, among other things, uh, advance notice of military actions, advance notice to Congress of intended military actions by the President, explicit time limits on the use of combat troops, uh, without and, and the requirement that the president withdraw troops without uh, unless the president sought and received uh, explicit congressional consent. But insofar as I can tell, and others can fill in here um, as well as I, I mean, you've been reading uh, the record just as I have, um, this critical posture that Congress sometimes adopts uh, has been altogether absent up until this point. Um, in fact, last night at the um, uh, 
conference that was uh, put on by President Bollinger, you know, we, I, it was one of the first times I really heard some some careful critical thinking about um, what the uh, the policy, the United States policy in this uh, in reaction to this crisis has been. It's not come out of Congress. Um, in fact, insofar as I can tell, the War Powers Act is a dead document insofar as this situation is concerned. It may have been already dead. Uh, in fact, you may remember that when the elder Bush uh, went, um, uh, was making preparations uh, for the counter-invasion of Kuwait, there was a, f a more vigorous debate in Congress about whether or not that should, in fact, occur, that, in fact, the president would, would uh, was was really uh, constitutionally able to take such action, whether Congress would approve it. Um, but as you may also remember, uh, President Bush said that he was going to go ahead with it anyway, no matter what Congress said. In fact, we really never saw the showdown because, uh, in fact, Congress did approve it. Now, last week then, Congress was uh, conspicuous, conspicuously absent from most of the media coverage. It was kind of hard to find anybody uh, on Capitol Hill talking about what the response ought to be. Occasionally you'd see some legislator, um, uh, some congressional leader or well-placed committee member, might, they might get enough airtime to uh, echo the president's moral outrage, to condemn uh, the terrorists, uh, to play to the militaristic audience back home, perhaps, with an eye to uh, picking up a few more votes or supporters, um, and to generally, you know, provide us with uh, repetitions of these odes to unity and freedom <coughs> on the one hand, and this, uh, as Ken mentioned, off with their heads uh, retribution on the other. Uh, in fact, if you haven't read it, I would recommend uh, that you uh, search out uh, Senator Carl Levin's floor statement from last week. Um, I, I have to say I was a bit surprised by it. It was very much this sort of uh, mawkish patriotism and we're behind you all the way, Mr. President. Now collectively Congress did take action last week and I'm not going to go uh, into uh, a great deal of detail about what they did. They passed a resolution authorizing military action and the language they used was this, that, in fact, let me give it to you exactly. Um, resolved that the president is authorized to use all necessary and appropriate force against those nations, organizations, or persons he determines planned authorized, committed, or aided the terrorist attacks that occurred on September 11, 2001, or harbored such organizations or persons in order to prevent any future acts of international <coughs> terrorism against the United States by such nations, organizations, or persons. Now, for those of you who are as old as I am or older, uh, that ought to create a bit of, uh, sort of evoke a kind of lingering nausea from about um, 30 years back. Um, a similar resolution passed uh, uh, Congress, H.J. Resolution 1145 on August 7th, 1964, resolved by the Senate and House of Representatives of the United States of America in Congress assembled that the Congress approves and supports the determination of the President as Commander-in-Chief to take all necessary measures to repel any armed attack against the forces of the United States and to prevent further aggression. Now, of course, that came to be known as the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. Uh, it was used by Presidents Johnson and Nixon to escalate the Vietnam War for seven more years, even as congressional uh, and public support for the war waned. Uh, it was a resolution that many legislators came and most of the public came to regret. Um, so uh, at this point, um, the Congress has responded with a grant of, uh, of authority um, uh, to uh, President Bush and, I would add, also an authorization for $40 billion in funds, which was m more than even 
even President Bush had originally hoped for, uh, for Bush to carry out whatever activities that he uh, deems necessary and appropriate. Um, now let me say a little bit about why I think that the legislators that Congress assembled acted in the way that they did. Um, and it really goes to, I think, what are the two central motivations of most politicians, which are these. Um, you claim credit for, you do what you can to claim credit for good policies, and you do what you can to avoid harm for bad policies. Uh, now, as Ken has already remarked, the, uh, uh, this is, our, our options here, the good policy options are extremely limited. Uh, the Bush administration is in a very difficult position. It may be in one in which is going to create many more problems uh, than it solves. And so I think it's not simply this uh, impulse of patriotism, that in fact there is um, a fair amount of uh, feeling, certainly within the Democratic Party, uh, that they don't want to take responsibility for. They don't want to be held accountable for whatever policies are to come. Um, in fact, I'd take you back to uh, the first drafts of the resolutions, which I, the final draft of which I just read from. They were passed in both the House and the Senate. <coughs> the first one said, if I can find it, that resolved that the Senate and House of Representatives commit to support increased resources in the war to eradicate, eradicate terrorism. And then the eighth provision, support the determination of the President in close consultation with the Congress to bring justice and punish the perpetrators of these attacks as well as their sponsors. That resolution actually passed in the Senate. A very similarly worded resolution passed in the House, got very little attention. It wasn't until Saturday then that a, that the that a ne negotiated resolution, the one really supported by the White House, passed and had that sweeping language then that I just read from. In fact, Senator Daschle's office was uh, working hard at first to include language that was more restrictive, and ultimately gave in in part because of that the members of the uh, the Democratic members of both the House and the Senate saw that they uh, really wanted to avoid harm for potentially bad policies rather than put themselves in a position to play a greater role but also take the blame for bad policies. I'll stop there and, and talk a little bit about their domestic response if people are interested uh, in the question and answer period. Thank you, Rick. David Thatcher. Uh, in response to last week's attacks, one of the ways in which you and I are going to be most directly affected is through our experiences at the airport with security. And I want to talk today about one aspect of the airport security issue, uh, the use of ethnic profiling as a security device that we've heard about and why we should oppose it, partly because the hijackers last week were apparently from the Middle East. We're especially talking here about profiling Arab Americans as possible terrorists, as well as people from other ethnic groups who are often confused with Arab Americans. I'm talking about uh, the practice of singling these groups out for heightened scrutiny as a routine practice for airport security, and also about the use of security practices that have a disparate impact on Arab Americans. And it's important to say at the outset that heightened scrutiny like this is much more than a simple inconvenience. I'm not going to tell you stories today about what people go through in these interrogations and searches at the airports to convince you of that. I can only ask you to talk with Arab Americans who have flown this week about their experiences with customs and airport security and law enforcement and to imagine how much worse those experiences would get if we embraced more fully a, a, an explicit practice of ethnic profiling. These interrogations can be intrusive, they can be humiliating, they can regularly mean that you will miss your flight, they can mean you have to show up at the airport hours before your fellow passengers who are white show up at the airport, and a few, uh, in order to prepare for the worst, and in a few cases they've even led to unjust uh, detainment and arrest. 
when these experiences are repeated ag again and again, and that's exactly what would happen under, a, under a, an explicit system of ethnic profiling, Arab Americans would, uh, their decisions about uh, whether to fly at all and what, at what threshold to fly at all uh, w would, would clearly be affected. So we're talking about a significant burden that Arab Americans could be asked to pay and in some ways are already being asked to pay in the fight against terrorism. A lot of the arguments I've been hearing over the past week um, about these issues are pragmatic arguments. A lot of people seem to resist profiling on the grounds that it's ineffective. Um, what profile some people have asked would have caught the seminary student who was returning to his studies from a visit with his mother and was detained by airport security with hand grenades. What profile would catch the single woman who was tricked into smuggling a bomb on a plane by her boyfriend? And much more important than these anecdotes, I think there's a general possibility that many people argue that if we rely on profiling as a way of coping with security, uh, security practice as a way of deciding whom to scrutinize, the terrorists will simply evade the profiles. They'll hire people who don't fit the profiles to plant the bombs, and to the extent possible, they'll change their own appearance and, their, and falsify their names and backgrounds. There's a lot to these sorts of pragmatic objections against ethnic profiling, but I don't want to say any more about them today because, to me, they don't get to the heart of the reasons why we should object to ethnic profiling and its relatives. These arguments suggest that if it turned out that ethnic profiling were rational, uh, in this narrow sense, if it turned out that terrorists were more concentrated in one ethnic group than another, that we should support it. And I don't accept that. Again, I think that even if it turned out the profiling were rational in that narrow sense, that we should reject it for moral reasons, for reasons that have to do with the rule of law in a democracy, and for reasons that have to do with racial and ethnic relations in this country. And I want to spell these reasons out today because I don't think they've been coming through clearly in the media discussions that I've heard over the past week, even among the majority of commentators who oppose this practice. For a lot of us, the, our opposition to um, uh, the moral case, the mor our moral opposition to racial and ethnic profiling is simply a matter of intuition. It's simply intuitive to a lot of us that the benefits and the burdens of public policy ought to be shared equally, unless there's some unavoidable reason Otherwise, and ethnic profiling is in a way the paradigm case of a policy that distributes its, pol its burdens uh, very unequally. We can, uh, to adapt a nice metaphor that Randall Kennedy introduced on a slightly, uh, a very similar subject, um, it, it's, it's equivalent to levying a special tax on Arab Americans to support public safety. Although everyone supposedly benefits from safer, safer air travel, we're asking one group in particular to pay this tax exclusively. So apart from our basic intuitions that that's unacceptable, why do we object to that? And why do people who don't share that basic intuition, why should they accept that? I want to offer two reasons here. And the first reason is that policies like this aren't consistent with democratic decision making. When you tell some people what I just said, when you tell them that airport profiling amounts to a special kind of tax on Arab Americans to support public safety, they respond that although that's regrettable, it's unavoidable since the rest of us simply aren't in a position to pay that tax effectively. And again, I don't want to say any more than I already have about the rationality of profiling, but many people of goodwill suggest that we shouldn't blind ourselves to unpleasant facts about the ethnic background of many of the terrorists. The trouble, I think, with this common response is that there is an alternative to heightened s scrutiny of Arab Americans, and the alternative is heightened scrutiny across the board. If we want to make airlines safer, then airport security ought to be forced to increase the it, it ought to be forced to increase surveillance on everyone. Unlike ethnic profiling, that kind of heightened scrutiny across the board is consistent with an important ideal of democracy, namely the rule of law understood in its broadest sense. The rule of law says that when we adopt a policy, it has to apply to everyone. It cannot be tailored to one person or to one group, and we're committed to this ideal because it requires, it, it forces all of us to ask ourselves an important question when we consider whether we support any policy. It forces us to ask ourselves, am I willing to be subject to this law? Am I willing to pay this price in the fight against terrorism? Will my gains in safety outweigh this added burden of searches and interrogations and delays that I will have to go through? 
with ethnic profiling, the majority of us never have to ask ourselves that question. For the more majority of us, ethnic profiling will be, bring no real burden at all, just the speculative possibility that we'll be safer. This is a form of political cheating. It secures its majority for policies that infringe on our liberty by asking only one identifiable subgroup of the population to, uh, to bear those burdens. It lets our politics escape the fundamental question here, which is how much of our liberty we ought to be willing to trade for whatever benefits and safety increased surveillance will bring and whether those alleged benefits are real. It's no accident, I think, that profiling is done somewhat sloppily and without solid evidence that it works, and that's because the majority of us aren't burdened by it at all, and so we have no incentive to be terribly concerned about whether it's effective. Now, you might object that my alternative to profiling is unrealistic, that we can't literally interrogate everyone and thoroughly search everyone who gets on a plane, but there are things that we can do. We can reduce the number of people going through the gates in the first place so that we can more thoroughly scrutinize the people who, who do go through, and that, incidentally, I think is one of the justifications for um, the idea that we, we shouldn't let unticketed passengers through the gates you reduce the sort of throughput. Uh, we can also use improved technology that screens individuals more efficiently and use the equipment that airports already have uh, more efficiently. We can use random searches and increase the probability that all of us will be searched. We can use behavioral profiling where law enforcement decides whom to scrutinize based on their responses to preliminary questions. And we can simply use security approaches that don't have to do with screening at all like sky marshals and bag matching and other ideas. Um, all of those ideas, all of those alternatives are consistent with the rule of law in the sense that I just described. They require all of us to ask whether the potential benefits uh, outweigh the likely costs. They don't load all of the costs onto one group and give the rest of us a free ride. So we shouldn't be misled into thinking that this is a trade-off between safety and equality. We can be safe and uphold um, essential democratic ideas about equality at the same time. If there's a trade-off, it's a trade-off with efficiency, not with safety. <laughs> Perhaps ethnic profiling would allow security to search and interrogate fewer people to intercept the same number of terrorists. Perhaps it wouldn't, but either way, we shouldn't excuse discrimination on the grounds that it, it's financially difficult and too slow to treat everyone equally. The second reason I think we should reject ethnic profiling in any screening practice that has a disparate impact on Arab Americans is that uh, these policies perpetuate, may perpetuate stigma, they may exacerbate ethnic tensions, and they may undermine the legitimacy of our law enforcement. If you and I walking through the airport invariably or very often see that it is just Arab Americans who are being detained by airport security, we are likely to come to one of two conclusions. Conclusion number one is that these people really are terrorists. That is, some of us are going to assume that law enforcement knows what it's doing and that people they've detained either have done something wrong or belong to a dangerous group. Conclusion number two is that the problem lies with law enforcement rather than with Arab Americans. That is, some of us are going to come to the conclusion that these law enforcement and security agents are biased, that they're engaging in unjustified profiling, unfairly stopping innocent people, and so on. Again, I think these are the most common conclusions that we're likely to come to, perhaps unconsciously, in the very unconsidered judgments that we're going to make as we hurry through the airports again and again past these scenes of Arab Americans being detained at the security gates. And I think most of you will agree that, mo that both of them are destructive conclusions. Conclusion number one exacerbates racial and ethnic tensions in this country, and it perpetuates habits of ethnic stigma, which is one of the most serious problems that our society faces. And conclusion number two is hardly better because it undermines the legitimacy of our law enforcement. So I, I just want to conclude quickly by reminding you that the staggering majority of people who will be burdened by any system of ethnic profiling will be innocent people. They will not be terrorists. They will not have done anything wrong. They will not be doing anything wrong. Um, and to ask innocent people who happen to be Arab American to bear the cost of our war on terrorism is deeply unjust and destructive in all the ways that I just described. It's antithetical to core principles of the rule of law and democracy. 
It runs a very real risk of exacerbating ethnic tensions in this country, and it may end up undermining law enforcement rather than strengthening it. The argument for, for ethnic profiling is not about safety, but an argument about efficiency and modest savings in time and money, if they really exist at all, cannot justify that kind of practice. Thanks. Thank you, David. Um, we have time for a variety of back and forth between the audience and the panel, and um, I invite your questions, your comments, your arguments. some wonderful discussions, you know, last night and right now, and also on the radio and on television, uh, of people coming forth from various disciplines offering their thoughts about things. And I know that administrations do use advisors, but uh, do you have any sense, having been in an administration as an advisor, uh, how this one is using advisors? Are they, are they really looking for a broad sense of information and opinion from dif different disciplines? Are they looking for people who might support what they really want to do anyway? Uh, as a person totally ignorant of what goes on at that level, I'm wondering what your thoughts are about that. Hmm. Well, uh, a couple of things. One, I, I was in the Clinton administration not as an advisor, but as an official. So it, it's a different, uh, somewhat different perspective from this. Um, and different administrations really do differ. I mean, the president sets the tone for how the White House will operate and how the key agencies will plug in in the policy process. Uh, at that level, it becomes uh, really quite individual. Uh, 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 so that, that that's an important dimension. Uh, secondly, uh, events drive who has influence. Uh, to give you an example from the Clinton administration, in 19, late 97-98, much of our foreign policy toward Asia uh, was determined by Bob Rubin, who was our Secretary of the Treasury. Why? Because there was an Asian financial crisis. Clinton had enormous confidence, I think rightly so, in Rubin's judgment on international financial issues, and the Treasury played a role that eclipsed the Pentagon and the State Department during that period of time. By the end of 2000, that was nowhere in sight, right? So if you apply that kind of thing to the current situation, I think several things are the case. One, uh, uh, it is natural uh, that the military and security people would gain relative influence uh, because we are in what is defined as fundamentally a military and security crisis. Um, secondly, uh, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to get personal here, but let me just make a, a broad comment. Uh, this administration is composed of very different types of people, uh, representing uh, deep divisions within the Republican Party. Uh, and while you can find different kinds of folks in different bureaucracies, uh, there's a disproportionate uh, 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 concentration, if you will, of, of extraordinarily right-wing people in the Department of Defense at high levels right now. Uh, much less so on the Department of State, uh, less so on the National Security Council. So I think a lot depends upon, you know, at the highest level, when you sit down in a principals committee meeting with, with, you know, with six key players around the table, and then you go and advise the president from there, you know, who's going to have the, the greater say? Uh, my own sense, frankly, is that Colin Powell, A, is superb, uh, B, B is being put in front of the cameras a lot, and C is losing influence. Uh, because I think the dynamics of this are to put the money in the hands of the people over at the Pentagon. Uh, he's most sensitively responded to some of the complexities. Young, as you talk with foreign officials, and I've had some opportunity to do that in the past week, uh, what you find time and again is almost an expression of hope that Powell will play a larger role now, because he was seen as being marginalized in the internal battles within the administration. But real concern that that is not the way it's going to come out. Now, let me say, I share their hope, because uh, I think, that, and as Bob also indicated, diplomacy has a huge role to play here. Uh, and a kind of, let's go get them kind of response is really going to leave us uh, without the allies that we need. I don't mean formal, I mean without the cooperation that we need to really do an effective job. Um, 
One final comment, which is to say, when you get a national security crisis, it tends to drive you to look inward rather than outward, in the sense that rather than call in all kinds of experts from all over the place and sit and have a chat with them, you are so busy trying to get through the next couple of hours, coordinating the different things that are going on, setting up the task forces, getting in touch with other governments, making sure your security is in place, thinking up new rules for the transportation system, wondering what, how we will change the rules in our justice system and so forth. It's the last time in the world you have to sit down and have the kind of roundtable discussion that in a calmer period could really produce some very good ideas. And that's just by the nature of things. Ultimately, a very small group of people makes the key policy decisions, and they are just totally inundated at this point. Let me yes, add, can I add one yeah. word to that? Yeah. Um, they certainly haven't consulted with uh, anyone in Congress in any kind of serious way. Um, in fact, there's been a great deal of disgruntlement on the part of uh, even some of the key members of the Foreign Policy and Armed Services Committees. Um, some real disgruntlement on the part of um, key members of the of the uh, foreign affairs and uh, um, um, armed services committees that they're that they're getting really uh, any meat in their intelligence briefings at all. Um, I think that's fun. I, I don't think that's the major problem, but I do think it possible um, in the coming weeks. <laughs> that Congress can play the role of doing exactly what um, Ken has suggested, that in fact they can hold hearings, they can bring in reflective people, they can um, talk about and would talk about the, the kinds of issues that, um, that we've been talking about, and that uh, I think in fostering that kind of, uh, that kind of uh, calmer, uh, cooler, um, uh, more reasoned approach, um, I think uh, Congress could, and then force, in effect, by holding those hearings, forcing the administration to pay attention to it, um, um, by if implicitly causing the public to pay attention to it, I think they could play a useful role. Yeah, question over here. I, I think it doesn't look like the Gulf War to anybody. No, no. <laughs> a quick response. Uh, I agree. I have a question yeah. for David. Mm -hmm. I understand your position concerning ethnic profiling, but I assume that you are not against profiling per se. Uh, with yes qualifications. No? Uh, not, not, not in all cases, okay. but... Mm -hmm. Now let's assume now we, we establish a profile that leads us to examine closer not ethnically, but we take a look and see who made three or four trips to Afghanistan, Saudi Arabia, et cetera. And how do you feel about that? Uh, and, and that seems to be, the FAA has a system of profiling in place right now. They're very secretive about what criteria they do, in fact, use. Most spokespeople say that they don't use ethnicity per se, but they, they do use things like travel behavior. Um, I'm uncomfortable with any form of profiling, and the reason I hesitated at your initial question was I'm, I'm comfortable with, uncomfortable with any form of profiling that essentially acts as a proxy for ethnicity, and that uh, the same arguments that I just made, so long as we're talking about, you know, visible detainment, so long as we're talking about grossly disproportionate detainment, so long as we're talking about uh, a disparate impact that everybody knows about, that the same arguments that I described apply and that we should focus on uh, things like behavioral profiling rather than these sort of proxies that get at travel behavior. Um, I'm not totally opposed to the idea, but we need to track very carefully how the impact um, uh, plays out. Travel behavior is behavior, actually. Right. Could I just say that uh, racial profiling is important, but another civil liberties issue that I think is going to be equally important is privacy and who gets to tap our phones and read our email. The Justice Department has just proposed new yeah. legislation uh, allowing them to violate yeah. many more of those. Yeah. I would have a question. Um, I wanted to touch on something Professor Axelrod said and sort of get at the issue of, of uh, future foreign policy responses. Um, you mentioned that the, the, the conflict, continuing conflict um, in the Middle East, Palestinian-Israeli situation, needed to end um, before these types of terrorism could end. Um, 
I'm wondering, would U.S. support for a Palestinian homeland, say we, you know, radically change, would that even be enough, though? I mean, if the type of terrorism is ideologically based um, against democratic systems, against free market capitalism, um, would even full U.S. support for a Palestinian homeland, say, um, be enough, you know, to, to support this type of terrorism? I don't think full su American support of Palestinian homeland would solve the Israeli-Palestinian problem because the Israelis um, are still need to accept whatever settlement is reached. Right now, there's as of yesterday, there was an optimistic move by both the Palestinian Authority and the Israeli government to have a ceasefire, and the Hamas and Islamic Jihad said that they will not support that. Let, let me add two words to that, if I could. One, uh, I certainly agree that the Arab-Israeli dispute has made all of this much more difficult. Uh, but I think if you were to resolve that tomorrow, terrorism would still be a major problem. Uh, a lot of the things that motive I mean, face it, what's happened in part because of forces of globalization and telecommunications revolution, all that kind of stuff, uh, we benefited more than any other society on earth from all of that. Uh, we, we have such a strong role in the world now that it is difficult for Americans to comprehend what we look like if you aren't an American. Uh, and uh, one of the greatest challenges that this poses is a cultural challenge. And there are a lot of folks in different parts of the world who feel that their core values are being under, undermined, their ability to transmit their values to their own children is being undermined by the kinds of processes, part of which America promotes and part of which America simply symbolizes. Right? Uh, what this terrorist action did, uh, and maybe its greatest consequence, and I should have mentioned this in my remarks, I, I apologize for not doing so, is it took this image of an absolutely invulnerable United States and burst it. And it burst it in a way that did more damage in one day than an army could have done in six months with any army on Earth, right? If you don't think there are others who have taken a look at that and said, thank God, and now we can follow up, and we can pick up the torch if necessary, I think it would be naive to think that, that those forces aren't out there. In a number of societies, there are always fringe elements, but what this did was to, was to burst a myth. Right? And uh, in that sense, I think we've got a long-term problem. I don't think that just the Arab-Israeli thing was either the sole cause or could be the, the key to the entire solution. Washington over the past five years, <coughs> the mainstream foreign policy makers until very recently, oh, Afghanistan, you know, we just want to build a fence around it and um, let them fight their war. It's not an important issue. We're really not interested in anyone who has anything to say about that part of the world, about that country or what's going on there. Um, is this, do you think that the people, one who were involved in, in the 80s, working with these groups are talking to the policy makers and actually know some of them, the people that train us in these groups, have any insight into their um, their way of operating, and will, will we look at other parts of the world where there's instability and, and take them more, take solving this problem more seriously? Um, I think that we certainly are seeking uh, good information about uh, the internal dynamics in Afghanistan now from people who have been deeply involved there. But I think those tend to be Russians, Pakistanis, and Chinese. And then some, obviously, from our involvement in the 80s. But a lot has changed since the 80s. You know? uh, so I've, one of the reasons why we're trying to uh, improve coordination uh, with Russia and Pakistan and China now is precisely to share the intelligence output with them uh, in a way that can be used effectively. Um, I, you know, 
Uh, I don't think that there was serious thought. I'm, I'm not sure I understood part of your question correctly. Were you asking in part, why didn't we uh, in the 90s try to uh, help establish a stable Afghan government? Well, the problem is there's instability in much of the world. And so you really have to pick where you're going to get involved and where you aren't. And when you pick a place, what you find very often, well, I'll give you a different example, Indonesia, what you find very often is you cannot get consensus, say, on Capitol Hill to allow you to do <coughs> what you need to do to play an effective role in Indonesia. Uh, now, this is the largest m Muslim country in the world. It is a major, has been a major factor for stability and growth in Southeast Asia until the Asian financial crisis. Basically saw its government disintegrate and then get patched together in a, in a very wobbly form uh, after the fall of Suharto. And what we found was we couldn't deal with the government of Indonesia because of the Human Rights Caucus in the Congress that would not allow us to deal with the Indonesian military, which was the only organization with a nationwide reach in Indonesia, right? And we wanted to put in aid and wanted to do all, couldn't do a thing. Until, you, until the military changed in Indonesia, you couldn't do a thing. The Congress blocked everything you could imagine, right? And it wasn't for lack of trying by the administration. So what you find is very often you have a lot of different agendas uh, represented in different parts of our government. They're legitimate agendas. You very, very rarely find a, a foreign policy issue worth its name that can be dealt with in isolation in terms of that issue. Scholars study issues in isolation. You know, how do you handle this issue or that issue? Policymakers never have that luxury. Uh, and you always are competing with other interests on other legitimate issues that intrude on what you're trying to do. So that even now as we respond in the Middle East, got to be very concerned about the financial markets, got to be very concerned about energy supplies and what Saudi Arabia might do. Uh, you know, there are all kinds of issues that are going to be cross-cutting as we try to focus on counterterrorism, right? So it's just not easy to kind of identify, oh, 10 years from now, this place may be if something comes back to haunt us, we better mobilize resources and put them there. Uh, you ought, that often gets drowned out by others competing for those resources to put them elsewhere for equally good purposes. So. Gentlemen over here in the door. During the well, during for the last, for the last uh, ten to twelve years, um, you know, what some, some people would argue that UN foreign policy uh, and, and we now have an enemy uh, and, it, and a sort of defined enemy. Uh, you know, argue about that. Um, but I have I have two connected questions and they're short questions. First. One of the big, one of the major pillars of U.S. foreign policy during the 90s was promotion of democracy. Um, are we going to go back on that now that we may want to deal with dictators who have anti-American forces in their backyard? Uh, and secondly, uh, which is sort of, I mean, homing in on this question is like Musharraf, uh, the guy you're dealing with right now, is a dictator, um, and the, and in, and in, especially in, in, in Pakistan's case. Uh, their intelligence agency uh, run two operations, uh, one in Kashmir and the other one in Afghanistan. And they're very closely linked. They're, they're sort of they're the defining features of Pakistan's foreign policy in that area. Now, if, they, if you want them to shut down the, the Afghan operation, they're using the same boys to run the operation in Kashmir. And so if, if let's say, the U.S. were to get into a strategic alliance, which Pakistan is requesting right now, Will they be able to shut down the Kashmir operation? So you see that there's a sort of a conflict of interest there. I'd, I'd like Pro Professor Axelrod and, and Professor Liebelhoff to respond to that. Well, I'll make a clear prediction that, that the priority to fight terrorism will trump the priority to promote democracy. Now then the question, is that a good idea? Uh, it's a good idea in the, in, uh, it, it, only so far. It was sort of like in the Cold War, we said the um, desire to fight communism would trump our desire to promote human rights and democracy, so we got in bed with Pinochet. And I suspect that now um, there's going to be a lot of pressure to work with whoever can help us, and Pakistan is an obvious case. 
And I think we need to keep our eye on some lower, some priorities that are getting lowered that they don't disappear entirely. The other one is nonproliferation. <coughs> uh, but no, I, I think you're exactly right. Uh, and this Kashmir, uh, the Kashmir issue obviously will complicate what we have been focused, what the administration has been focused on in the last few months, which is improving our ties with India. Right? And so, these things, again, these, these things are just the world is not neat. And you rarely see a foreign policy issue that you can neatly package and just focus on that without sacrificing other things that are of great value. Thank you. I guess I've become a little bit frustrated um, recently. I'm just wondering if any of the panelists can offer suggestions for things that we can do on this university campus to have an impact on what the government is Well, I thought Bob mentioned a couple of things at the end of his talk. I guess my response would be, you know, I, try, I was trying to think about that when he did that. Um, I mean, I, I think the, um, some of the issues that were raised in the panel discussion last night had to do with such things as American complicity in what, in the events that in the chain of events that led to the terrorist attacks. Um, you know, we're all assuming that Osama bin Laden is the culprit here, or that's the way we've been talking. There's also some speculation, at least, by um, uh, experts in the area that, that, that he simply did not have the organizational or financial capacity to carry it off, um, perhaps, but Saddam Hussein did. And so let's say, just for the sake of argument, that Saddam Hussein did. And then we might look at it differently. We might start thinking a bit about, you know, what are, what's, how, how, how self righteous we're being, or as opposed, how, how righteous we are as opposed to how self righteous we are about, con, uh, uh, about at least collectively claiming ourselves as innocent. And, and I think that at least some discussion about um, the, sort of the larger um, uh, willing uh, uh, thoughtfulness of the United States about what constitutes a just and unjust war and what constitutes um, justifiable retribution and what doesn't uh, ought to become part of the discussion. And that was raised last night. Now, I think that if that those would be the kinds of concerns I would raise if I were writing to my representatives in Washington. And I think they're going to be paying a lot of attention to the mail that's coming in over the coming weeks, right? Because it's going to change. If the mail's going to change from expressions of outrage and anger to to, I mean, that's going to slowly going to die off. And, you know, sort of attempts to raise new issues for consideration, especially issues that are being ignored by the administration, I think may receive some consideration by legislators who have the time um, to be um, more thoughtful or to consider a broader range of issues. I think they're going to be paying a lot, the, like your senators and representatives are going to be paying a lot of attention to what you say in the next few weeks. And so in terms of trying to communicate with them, that really does matter. They're really going to read it. They're going to pay attention to it. Their staff are. Their staff are going to summarize it for them. And I think it stands a chance of affecting what they do. I, th I think also universities, that that's the short term, over the long run, what is going to unfold, as, as several of the presentations here have, have made very clear, uh, will be will raise issues about the way we govern ourselves and the way we act internationally that are things that will be at the center, I think, of what universities will be focusing on in the years to come. Uh, and universities make their greatest contribution by educating citizens well uh, and by being sources of ideas that then get out through the media, to your members of Congress, through government service, through publications, and so forth. So I think there is a longer-term role for the university 
that is huge because I think some of the things that we have really taken for granted for quite a while are again, as they have been at earlier points in our history, going to be under challenge. I'm going to take one last question from over here. Uh, Dr. Lieberthal, <laughs> one of the strategies you suggested to stop terrorism was to infiltrate some of these cells and pay terrorists in some cases to you know, help our interests. That's an apparent contradiction with the Clinton administration. They, in essence, outlawed that policy. Do you comment on that? It's effective. Yeah, one of the things I found fascinating is I've been asked to be on all these panels there about terrorism in the Middle East. I was in charge of policy toward Asia, where terrorism was not a big issue when I was in the government. Uh, so uh, I come at this somewhat from the outside. Um, there were restrictions of various sorts placed on the executive branch, some at executive branch initiation, some uh, imposed by the Hill. Uh, Rick mentioned earlier the War Powers Act, for example, grown directly out of the Vietnam War. Um, and uh, those are restrictions that tend to be viable uh, if you are not facing a dire threat. Uh, in a sense, you can be more moral. You can be closer to your ideal principles when there's not a gun to your head. Yeah. And I think the fact that we now have a gun to our head will make people ask, where is the right place to draw the line given what we currently confront? And I think universities have to be asking very seriously, and how will that affect the longer term as part of that conversation? In other words, things done to meet an immediate, very serious challenge may over the long run be so pernicious that you really need to, to stay away from them. Uh, my feeling has been that uh, there, that century, we've got to have a little more freedom uh, to recruit some very unsavory characters uh, because these networks operate in very closed circles uh, and the people in those circles are not pleasant folks. And you simply cannot get at them uh, adequately from outside. And they have shown that they can do catastrophic damage uh, politically, economically, uh, in terms of loss of life and so forth. So personally, I think it is time to revisit some of these, um, uh, you know, some of these restrictions that we've imposed on ourselves. That doesn't mean toss them all out, but it does mean reconsider and see where the line.